All right. Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the second day of our annual symposium, Democracy, Risk, Relevance, Revival. Um, it's great to see people here again in person and online, and I'd also like to welcome anyone who's joining us for the first time uh, today, either in person or online. Uh, those of you who were here yesterday will remember that we were welcomed to country by Wurundjeri elder Georgina Nicholson. And before the proceedings begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet here in person, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander persons present today. Uh, we'll get straight into the program. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure to announce the chair of our first panel this morning is our very own Michelle Bruce from the Academy National Office. Many of you will know Michelle, who manages the Academy's international program, as well as our uh, awards and fellowship processes. Uh, and anyone who knows Michelle knows that there's basically nothing that you can uh, ask her that she doesn't know about the Academy, its processes, or some wisdom about what to do. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if those are exactly the, the skills that are required. It seems like a bit of an overqualification to be chairing a panel, but uh, we're very pleased to have Michelle chairing the first panel of the morning on democracy globally and in the region. Welcome, Michelle. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Richard, for that very kind introduction. Um, it was actually at a moment's notice that I was asked to chair this panel session today. Some of you um, may have seen that Professor Adrian Little was actually um, scheduled in the program to chair, but unfortunately he's been tied up this morning and I'm unable to attend. However, it's my great pleasure to introduce our three eminent panellists this morning who will be speaking about democracy globally and in the region. And uh, they include Professor James P. Fifner, who will talk about the breakdown of constitutional norms in the United States, and Professor Cheng Yang Li, who will speak about Confucianism and democracy with a case study of Singapore and China, and Professor Bao Gang He, who will talk about China's Belt and Road Initiative and its impact on political regime. Now, each of our speakers will speak for 15 minutes uh, this morning, and then we'll hold a Q&A session at the end. Now, if you're joining us online, um, please feel free to enter any questions into the question box, uh, or if you have a comment that you'd like to make for our um, panelists, feel free to put that into the chat box, and I'll be sure to read those out to our panelists at the Q&A session at the end. The Q&A session will go for approximately 25 minutes, and those of you joining us today um, in the audience, if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to raise your hand and one of our staff in the national office will uh, hand you a microphone. Uh, and it's my great pleasure now to introduce our first speaker for this morning, uh, Professor Bao Gang He. Uh, Bao Gang is Alfred Deakin Professor at Deakin University and a fellow of the Academy. He is widely known for his work in Chinese politics, in particular the deliberative politics in China, as well as in regionalism, international relations, federalism, and multiculturalism in Asia. Please welcome <laughs> Professor Bao Gang He. Thank you, Michelle. So it is uh, my great honor to speak of you. My, I will focus on this, uh, the case of the BI and the political regimes. So today we see this uh, a great challenge to democracy and the public participations. And those challenges, one of the challenges is the strategic rivalry between the United States and China. That has become a, a critical new condition that has influenced democracy today. So we see the American unipolar moment is over and the American democracy has been eroded. And Jan, we're talking about this issue later on. And this illusion of American democracy is likely associated with decline of democracy for some times in some country or regions. And China and the United States are likely to become a co-determine the fate of democracy and the human rights. So basically what we see is a prevailing 
geopolitics of the democracy. Democracy today seems to be become a slave, a slave of this the geopolitics. So, what are the most significant or noteworthy innovation address those challenges? How can democracy deal with the strategic rivalry between United States and China? Now, this is a new uh, question for all of us. We already see that um, President Biden um, committed to democracy, fighting back, and when he talking about autocracy versus democracy language. We also see the uh, the John French, he talking about benign competition. If there's a benign competition, and it is good for the Africa and for Asia. So he welcomes some strategic uh, competition between United States and, and China, but it must be benign. Then the, the other challenge is a kind of whether we can find the political compromise or collaboration on the sea, for example, on the global poverty reduction or rights to development. So that's another approach. The, the last one probably is a kind of we can talk about the democratization of geopolitics rather than democracy become slave of the geopolitics. Democracy play active roles, and through empower, in middle power, and the global south. So those are kind of four currently approach. There, it, it is uh, incomplete. There are more. What I do, I I try to do today is how can those uh, challenge be addressed at uh, a cognitive level. The one, uh, the one of the issues I would like to address is a proper, adequate understanding China model, in particular, Chinese Belt Road Initiative. So we should not adopt a simplistic, polarized dichotomy between democracy and autocracy. So one of the examples is a Belt Road Initiative. Um, a sophisticated understanding of the operation BAR hold a key to find a reconciliation and a cooperation. It is a more complicated than we thought. So let's think about this uh, uh, in the last decades, early 2015, Andrew Nathan published an article talking about how Chinese domestic region stability effort and uh, its transnational economic security pursuit are, deter are detrimental to democracy in six ways. This year, we see Chris Ordain, he published a book by, uh, by Bristol uh, University Press yeah, the entitled The Authoritarian Century, uh, Chinese Rising and the Demise of the Liberal in International Order. So I just wonder whether, uh, I, I'm, I'm a question whether the, this, uh, whether authoritarian become, this 21st century will become authoritarian century. I, I don't see it. I see the Chinese authoritarian system has own serious problem. It cannot last forever. It will be changed sooner or later. So let's talk, uh, talk about this uh, case of the um, uh, Belt Road Initiative. And uh, basically, I uh, said so those are the, this, this idea was proposed by Xi Jinping in 2013. It's a, it's a great infrastructure buildings uh, connect the continents, connect the country to countries, and connect Indian Ocean and the Pacific Oceans. So if we think about this uh, uh, um, BAR and, uh, and its relation to uh, re regime, so first starting point is that uh, BAR, Belt and Road Initiative, uh, is a kind of political neutral in, insofar as it aims to connect the country, continent, in respect of region type of political incarnation. So the, it's a, it is a very, it, it, 
it is a common sense that when the Chinese business SOEs engage in business, they will do whole, whole, whatever the political regime, they will do business. They want to fund their uh, business opportunities. So what we say, Chinese companies have uh, no qualms investing in well-established democratic country. In fact, they prefer to. Uh, if we look at this uh, the, the, in the, a few years ago, the United States, Australia, United Kingdom had a ranking first, second, and third for Chinese foreign investment. So the Chinese uh, SOEs found that those uh, democratic countries and provide a safe, safety, well-regulated, relative less corruptions. So it's the best investment. We already say also China has worked with a liberal democracy like Greece and Italy when they have a faced economy crisis and the difficulties. So among those uh, uh, the country who signed the BAI, uh, there are quite many uh, uh, liberal dem democracies. So in particular, there is a growing Chinese literature on the political and economic risk of the BAR recipient countries. So they found on the semi-democracy, there has been a negotiation like the project in Malaysia or suspended or, or, or like the new negotiation port Hamburg to total in Sri Lanka due to change in government through the elections. Uh, when they work with the uh, autocratic government, BOR project are subject to ongoing regulation and the corruption issue has uh, slowed down the BOR project in some of the Central Asian countries. Autocratic rulers often make frequent dis discretionary changes with a person and unexpected intervention in contract negotiation. So in short, the Chinese entrepreneur and company has preferred to invest in Western democratic countries like Canada and Australia. So, but at the same time, we observe the, another phenomenon which I call region affirmity. That is our authoritarian government uh, more pro PR than the democratic one. We already see that United States, Australia uh, resist PR, and uh, and uh, then the, the China did a, a study to look at this uh, the, the PR participation index. Among the top ten countries that participate PR project. Most of those countries are the authoritarian states like Russia, the several the key states in Central Asia. So authoritarian countries are generally eager to be associated with the BAI for the reason of uh, economic benefit. But at the same time, we should uh, keep in mind that infrastructure development uh, need a long-term plan and a stable government to implement the plan. So that always lead to uh, the, those authoritarian governments sometimes uh, create a favorable condition for Chinese to develop those infrastructure development projects there. The Chinese company has a capacity to buy off or provide funding for politicians to win election, as happened in the Cambodia, Sri Lanka, and the Philippines. Such corruption is a much less likely to be pub publicly publicized, uh, scrutinized in authoritarian regions. So authoritarian regions are also less concerned about the Chinese control mechanism since they organize their own society in a similar way. Democratic society, in contrast, will naturally oppose the control mechanism of the BER that are <coughs> unaligned with democratic principles. So, so, so far we have been just discussing this uh, complex relationship between BAI and the political regime. So let's address one of the uh, question, which is a current commentator always said the, uh, the, is the issue about have 
ever be a receiving country become more susceptible to an authoritarian division if they embrace a Chinese model of development? This is a big question. So let me just very short to answer these issues. So first, uh, the Tansy, he uh, from the King's College of London, he did a, a paper that he said the common view is that China is uh, on global mission to promote autocracy. This, this is inaccurate. It is not Chinese deliberate promotion program that lead to consolidation of authoritarianism in the world. Authoritarian state already exists. What China has done is to reinforce them. The China model has been adopted and adapted by some Asian Africa country with significant modification. It is, however, cannot be replaced democracy. There's no way China can abolish democracy in many uh, Asian Africa countries. What we see in the last few years, despite the COVID, democracy continue to uh, hold regularly. Note that China can prolong authoritarianism in Africa and in Asia, even at its home. So finally, let me just look at this. Uh, the, the issue is uh, we're talking about this the, um, at beginning with this uh, uh, geopolitics of democracy, how the geo geopolitics has influenced democracy. And uh, I made a number of suggestions how, how the world has handled this issue. So here I would like to very quickly look at the Chinese own solution associated with the democratic elements in the BAR project. So uh, this year, China launched a global development initiative, uh, a global poverty reduction program in UN. And uh, Chinese kind of, uh, currently this new round of BAR infrastructure project embrace Japanese style quality investment standards. The last year, the China and the EU, uh, EU's comprehensive agreement on investment, including provision for protection of workers' rights. In the place like Sri Lanka, Chinese post campaign announced extensive consultation joint contribution share benefit. The China has established a public consultation mechanism in BAR receiving countries, reinforced rights to trade union in Brazil, for example, when Chinese companies take over some of the local ones. China also has established an anti-corruption ambassador to the BAR receiving countries. And China also monitors Chinese companies involved in BAR. So all those are Chinese innovations. So let me just sum up. So there's a come back to this key question. How can democracy deal with the strategic rival between United States and China? The dominant pattern is, uh, 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 is, is a political language, autocracy versus democracy. And what I try to do in today's talk is look at is how the, how it, what happened, uh, 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 what's really the impact of BAR on political re regime. So many cases, many cases, does not support the claim that China promotes authoritarianism globally. So what we found is that this uh, the complicated case of BER indicates there are some possibility for political compromise, collaboration, for example, on the global poverty reduction and the rights to development. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm honored to have the opportunity to share my uh, research uh, with you. Uh, my topic is uh, from Confucian democracy to Confucianism plus democracy, uh, the case of Singapore and uh, China. Now, um, Confucianism uh, is the mainstream tradition uh, in China uh, as well as some uh, overseas Chinese communities, uh, including uh, Singapore, which is uh, over 70% Chinese. Now, Confucianism uh, has been perceived 
uh, for a long time, uh, in modern time, as opposed to democracy. Uh, early last century, uh, the main force movement in China uh, mainly opposed uh, Confucianism with democracy and science. So the two main ideas from the West, science and democracy, were taken as forces to fight the Confucian tradition. And uh, to a large extent, that uh, opposition uh, was true. Confucianism was not democratic, for sure. And uh, to some extent, uh, in modern time, it was uh, an obstacle uh, for democracy. However, in the last few decades, uh, there has been a discourse uh, under the general umbrella of Confucian democracy. Uh, the idea is to uh, preserve the Confucian tradition, reform it, given that it is the main tradition of the Chinese people, and trying to integrate it, and at least make it coexist with the democracy. Uh, within that discourse, there are a few main uh, streams of thought. One is I call the communitarian uh, Confucian democracy, uh, represented by uh, American scholar David Hall, the late David Hall, and uh, Roger Ames, uh, who retired from University of Hawaii, now is a chair professor at Peking University in China, and also So Hong Tan, a professor at a management university in Singapore. Uh, this group of scholars uh, try to integrate uh, Confucianism with John Dewey's philosophy of democracy and see uh, a natural affinity between Confucian tradition and uh, the kind of uh, democracy advocated by John Dewey. That is, build a community and uh, uh, through academic, uh, through democratic activities, you uh, rally people in the community and build a culture of uh, democracy. And that goes with the uh, uh, Confucian tradition. Now, this group, however, uh, are vague on the political institution of democracy, how to introduce that into uh, China, for example. They are vague on that. Another group, uh, often labeled as the Confucian meritocracy, uh, including the Chinese scholar uh, Jiang Qing, uh, who is at the right, uh, the, your right upper corner of the screen, and uh, uh, the Canadian scholar Daniel Bell. Now, he was in China for uh, over decades. Now, it's uh, uh, professor in Hong Kong University, and also uh, Joseph Chen, uh, who is also at uh, Hong Kong uh, University. Their view basically is that in order to maintain this ideal of meritocracy in the Confucian tradition, you need to marry meritocracy with democracy through political arrangement. For example, uh, for Daniel Bell, he proposed that uh, you have this, uh, at a grassroots level, grassroots level, you have a direct election, popular election democracy, but at the very top leadership in China, specifically, uh, you have these wise people who are already there to collectively uh, decide what to do uh, on national leadership. I have offered a critique of his model. He calls it the China model, actually. Uh, I said, you know, the uh, major problem with that model is at the top, there is no checks and balances, as we observed uh, in the top Chinese government in recent years. And Jiang Qing it has a more traditional approach. Uh, he wanted to establish uh, the kind of traditional Confucian cultural upper house, uh, 
then uh, with Confucian uh, represented then a, a national heritage branch, uh, which in, in uh, includes other traditions like Buddhism, uh, uh, Taoism. Uh, then there is a people's uh, chamber, which is elected by people uh, directly. So it's, there is a, a democratic component there. Then Joseph Chen has this uh, uh, system that there is a, a lower house uh, directed, uh, directed by the people, and there is an upper house uh, recommended by uh, scholars, by colleagues. So similar like the British system. In the last two, um, uh, last few years, more and more people are moving more uh, in a dis larger discourse, are moving into the more uh, liberal uh, end of the spectrum. They advocate the kind of uh, Confucianism plus democracy. Uh, they don't want to give up on Confucianism as a you know, cultural tradition, and they also see democracy as an independent political arrangement, a political institution. So they want these two uh, to work together. I uh, support the third, the, the last one, basically. Whether you call it democracy plus Confucianism or Confucianism plus democracy, these two are different things. But as a political institution, democracy can accommodate Confucian tradition. Now this is the third approach is a bottom-up approach uh, instead of a top-down approach, like the Daniel Bell approach. You set up a political system and get people there, then decide what to do. This is basically through general election, you uh, select people, elect people to serve in the government. And this tradition aims to abandon this idea, the Confucian tradition of the saviors, I call the saviors mentality. That is, the Confucian tradition, they have uh, always uh, upheld this idea of sages. You have these sages, they are our leaders, they are wise, they are perfect, they are capable, they are virtuous, and they lead us. And um, many of these, uh, several of these uh, models I showed you uh, include a component of that idea. They think these people at the upper level of the university, uh, the society are wiser, they are better than average people, and they, are, uh, they, they reflect this Confucian meritocracy ideal. I think it's time to give up on that mentality. Now, uh, for the third group of people, uh, it's not a simple matter of giving up the Confucian moral ideal of a meritocracy, the ideal that uh, we should select these knowledgeable, virtuous, honest, you know, uh, capable people to serve in government. Uh, you don't elect anybody. But the question is how to achieve that goal. And my argument has been that uh, even there are these people they are sagely like, but nobody can be sure who those people are. Uh, even God, there is a God, God knows, but God never tells us directly. So the only way, the next best way to find these people is through election. It's not perfect, but there's no better way. I think that's my argument uh, for this. And you can find the Confucian resources. Confucianism is a huge tradition you find very different streams of thought there. And there is this kind of anti, again, you know, democratic uh, talks, and also ideas uh, that can be used to support democracy. Mencius, for example, the second uh, greatest Confucian thinker after Confucius, said that heaven sees the, uh, through the, with the eyes of the people, and heaven hears with the ears of the people. Heaven, you know, stands for the ultimate right. It's not a god, but almost the, the, the cosmic principle of moral rightness. 
And that kind of idea, I think, can be used to support the third model I'm presenting here. Now I'm moving on to uh, give you a, pr a brief present here, uh, comparison of Singapore and China. Now, as some of you may be aware, in the last few days, there are many protests in China. It started about a week ago when uh, an apartment building in Xinjiang, uh, Urumuchi, uh, had a big fire, and 10 people died out of fire. And uh, uh, there are many, many rumors. Uh, we don't know for sure, but uh, the fire, uh, the death, was associated with this anti, uh, this uh, COVID control measurement of lockdown. People were not allowed to come out. Uh, it has been over three months in Xinjiang. People stay inside. And uh, also another reason is that um, uh, last week also uh, Chinese television. Uh, broadcast the uh, Qatar World Cup event. And the Chinese people see on TV uh, those, you know, tens of thousands of people gathered together without masks. They just have a good time. It seems COVID was over for them. They heard a rumor about that because they did not receive the full information. And uh, the national TV often feed them the news that in the U.S. how many thousand people died a day or something out of uh, COVID. So people were really afraid of it. Watching that uh, World Cup video, uh, you know, uh, games made people realize, that, hey, the world is not taking the uh, Omicron seriously. Why are we still having the lockdown? And that. Uh, those uh, factors uh, compounded have caused uh, young people to protest. And uh, uh, many university students uh, went to out uh, on campus on the street to protest. It's labeled as a white uh, blank paper protest. Uh, people hold a blank paper because you are not, not allowed to say anything and uh, they just hold a blank paper. But now you even cannot hold a blank paper in the public. Uh, the government is cracking down on that. <clears throat> and uh, we don't know how many universities. Uh, one uh, list I uh, read is over 100 universities. Uh, it may or may not be accurate. Uh, many universities in Beijing has started the winter break uh, almost two months before their uh, Chinese New Year. Usually, uh, you have to wait very close to it, but now at least uh, one and a half month ahead of time, so they can dismiss students, uh, sending them home. Uh, this is uh, some slogan on the building, um, which says basically, uh, we don't want great leaders, we want uh, to vote, we want uh, ballot to vote. And that is re related to my talk here. Now Singapore, briefly. Uh, Singapore and China both have authoritarian governments. Uh, what makes a big difference between them, having living, uh, lived in both countries, is that Singapore has real election. Sure, government, you know, sometimes play tricks like any uh, political party in any democracy uh, uh, towards their favor. But by and large, there is a uh, general election, and uh, the opposition party can openly campaign uh, for seats. Currently, the opposition party uh, holds 10 out of 103 seats in the parliament. In 2011, the party, Workers' Party, for the first time, one uh, group representation uh, constituency for the first time. That is a cluster uh, district. Uh, you have to have at least one minority, non-Chinese, in the uh, group to run to for maybe three or five seats together. And uh, one of your party uh, candidates must be a minority, non-Chinese. 
So the opposition party has been very weak uh, for a long time. And the first time uh, in 2011, they won this cluster uh, seats, I think uh, three or five. And that is a major uh, change. Uh, they have been gaining about 40% popular votes. And uh, many of them are uh, political scientists. You know when the votes get, popular votes get 40%, uh, there is a like, possibility of turning uh, the tide on that. But so far, uh, the government, uh, the ruling party has still tight control of the political situation. Um, okay, sorry. So the, the, the model I'm proposing is a, somewhat like a Singapore model. It's a kind of a, a democratic form as a social institution with the Confucian contents. That is, if you have a large population who believe in the Confucian tradition, the values, you can advocate it through democratic participation. In Singapore, for example, uh, uh, their housing policy has a clear compo Confucian component. If you buy an apartment close to your parents, you get a discount. You get a discount. The idea is you will be more likely to help your parents when they are, they are old, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. I think that you know, any party can uh, argue otherwise, but you go through uh, election and the legislation. Uh, to summarize, in the 21st century, I think uh, I belong to the third group here. Uh, the only viable Confucian politics is through democracy, without relying on any Confucian institution that guarantee Confucian in control. Uh, and it's time to give up on the ideal of sages. And uh, we rely on sages to save us. There are no sages. And uh, I think in the 21st century, Confucians should realize that. So that is uh, my recent argument and the recent work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, and thank you all the rest of my colleagues in the Academy of Social Sciences. I really appreciate this opportunity to make this presentation to you tonight. Uh, the topic is just crucial. The future of democracy in the world uh, is really important. It's under threat uh, from authoritarian nations as well as backsliding in some democratic countries. Uh, my presentation will focus on the United States uh, and the threat to the United States democracy, constitution, and rule of law uh, from former President Trump and his followers. I'll begin with the sources of Trump's uh, political power, that is his demagogic demagogic appeal uh, to his base of supporters. Next, I'll look at the sh how he shattered constitutional norms when he was president of the United States. Uh, after that, I'll look at how he, he attempted to overturn the 2020 uh, at presidential election and finally look at what's called the big lie that he actually won the 2020 election and how his followers uh, and state legislatures have tried to undermine the U.S. electoral system and encourage political violence. <clears throat> First of all, uh, Trump's based uh, his support on legitimate concerns of many Americans about the state of the economy, particularly blue collar workers, uh, who are suffering from automation, uh, outsourcing, globalization, the decline of labor unions, uh, sh which led to shuttering the factories, uh, and the decline of blue, uh, blue <laughs> well-paying blue-collar uh, jobs in the United States. In addition, social mobility has been decreasing, and even life expectancy in the United States has been going down. So these real economic and social conditions provided fertile ground for Donald Trump's populist appeal to the disaffected. Demographically, his appeal was strongest among several groups, older and blue collar whites without college degrees, uh, people who felt they were being displaced by minorities in the United States, religiously conservative evangelicals uh, and, and Catholics, particularly with uh, anti, those who are, uh, felt, uh, anti, were very anti-abortion. Uh, so Trump was able to combine 
uh, this volatile mix of racism, anti-Semitism, religion, uh, conspiracy theories to mobilize his supporters to undermine confidence in the United States electoral uh, system. Uh, so his uh, racism, particularly against blacks, immigrants, and Muslims, uh, characterize his campaigning and his appeal throughout the United States. His appeal to white Christian nationalism, uh, people who think that the United States should be a Christian, formally be a Christian uh, nation, and want uh, the government changed uh, in, in that direction. Uh, they also believe in the great replacement theory, uh, where they, they think that Democrats are trying to replace uh, tr legacy Americans with, in, it, with immigrants. <clears throat> now, shifting to Trump's breaking of norms when he was president, uh, I'll just list some of these ways. Uh, first, uh, common civility. Uh, he Trump, uh, Trump this was part of his appeal, uh, was his lack of, of common civility, which all of the presidents and all, almost all their politicians, uh, adhere to. Uh, he used his office for, uh, for personal gain. Uh, he refused to put his, uh, assets in a, in a blind trust, uh, and he, benefited personally, financially from uh, his office as other presidents have not. Uh, his lies differed significantly from those uh, of other presidents, uh, particularly things that were uh, demonstrably untrue and contrary to well-known uh, 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 and accepted facts. <clears throat> Uh, he also, of course, pressured uh, Ukraine uh, to uh, investigate his uh, uh, Joe Biden, who is going to be his uh, uh, likely uh, opponent in the 2020 election. Uh, he got uh, impeached for that. He used the uh, Department of Justice in the United States uh, to help his friends and to hurt his enemies. The Department of Justice is supposed to be um, uh, autonomous from uh, the presidency so that presidents can't put individual pressure uh, to uh, investigate enemies uh, and, uh, and help their friends. Nevertheless, uh, Trump did that. There's lots of de detail and documentation uh, in my paper. <clears throat> Uh, his abuse of the military, uh, he thought, uh, you know, on the one hand, he thought the United States is really strong and that's great. But at, at another level, he disrespected uh, uh, the United States military. In one meeting at the Pentagon, uh, he said, quote, you're all losers. You don't know how to win anymore. I wouldn't want to go to war with you people. You're a bunch of dopes and babies. Now, can you imagine in any other country, uh, the chief executive saying that to military leaders, the very top people, uh, outrageous, but that was what Trump uh, did. Uh, in addition, he distrusted his own intelligence people, uh, took the word of uh, Vladimir Putin uh, that there was no attempt to influence the election in 2016, despite uh, the unanimous consensus of the U.S. intelligence community uh, that they had. And he said that publicly uh, in, in Finland. Uh, next, uh, Trump's attempts to overturn the 2020 election. Now, as, as you all know, the peaceful transition of power is a sine qua non of, of democracy. And in the United States, traditionally, uh, the uh, loser in elections has graciously conceded defeat and congratulates the winner, even in very, very close elections like in, in 2000, uh, 2000 election, Al Gore immediately uh, conceded to president, as did uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016. <clears throat> But Trump didn't do this. First, he began undermining the election before it happened in the summer of 2020. He said that he was uh, would not accept the uh, he, he would not agree to accept the outcome of the election uh, it, during or immediately after or during the election. He falsely claimed that he had won when he clearly had not yet. All the votes were not uh, were not counted. Nevertheless, he publicly claimed that he had won. Uh, he also filed meritless lawsuits without evidence. <clears throat> now, in an election uh, involving more than 160 million voters and 230,000 polling places, it's probable that there's got to be some irregularity, irregularity someplace. And but Trump's uh, uh, lawyers searched all over, uh, and in and, and over 60 lawsuits, could not com uh, convince any judge uh, that that there was any fraud in the, in that election. Uh, in addition, uh, uh, he personally pressured state and local officials to, to not to certify election outcomes. So this is down at the city and county level. No other president has intervened to try to put pressure on those very low level people uh, to change election uh, outcomes. He also pressured governors and state legislatures to nullify the elections uh, in, in their state. And no president, again, has ever done that uh, to try to get the, the state legislature to overturn the popular election in a state uh, uh, and and uh, uh, switch the votes uh, to uh, 
to the incumbent, in this case, Donald uh, Trump. <clears throat> he considered using military force to overturn uh, the election. Uh, luckily, in the United States, there's a very strong military norm uh, that, the, that the military should stay out of politics uh, and be uh, absent from it. Uh, and they resisted and did not do that. Uh, Trump also pressured the Justice Department to overturn the election uh, by having wanting them to send out letters saying that the election was fraudulent or problematic, uh, and so uh, and to try to get states to change their uh, uh, electoral outcomes. Uh, he was unsuccessful because some of the, his own appointees at the very top levels of the Justice Department refused to do what he was uh, what he was telling them to do. Uh, and then, of course, you know he summoned this mob. Uh, to pressure Congress to change the vote outcome. So usually this is just a formality, counting the electoral votes in a joint session of Congress. Uh, but Trump, when everything else didn't work, uh, decided that he was going to make a showdown here uh, and try to uh, pressure his vice president, who was presiding over both houses of Congress in the ceremonial uh, uh, counting of votes. Uh, and he, uh, Trump asserted that tr uh, that Vice President Pence had the authority uh, to challenge and change state outcomes, uh, which is, you know, nobody in the in, in the U.S. history uh, has ever done that, uh, and Mike Pence, Vice President Mike Pence, to his great uh, 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 glory, said, no, I can't do that. Uh, <clears throat> but then Trump, okay, and th th this was when uh, Trump was uh, speaking to his uh, mob of followers uh, that and told them to go to the Capitol to put pressure on uh, Congress uh, and Vice President uh, Pence. Uh, and these people, many of them were armed. Uh, they were hostile. They were militias. Uh, <clears throat> and they were they had planned very carefully to go in, and invade uh, the Capitol building. Uh, they were chanting, uh, hang Mike Pence. They put up a, a gallows uh, on, on, a, uh, on the grounds outside uh, just... Um, I mean, this is just outrageous, but it did, in fact, uh, happen. Uh, and when uh, they, uh, <clears throat> Trump was told that he was uh, that they were chanting "Hang Mike Pence," uh, but Trump, instead of uh, you know telling them to back off, which he could have done at any time, uh, he didn't do it. He said, uh, he tweeted, "Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what he should have been done," which just, of course, egged on uh, the mob uh, at, at, at the Capitol. Uh, even though his White House aides, family members, and outside advisors pleaded with him to call off the mob. He refused to do it uh, for more than uh, three hours. Okay, so ab after uh, the election and Trump left uh, left office, uh, Trump continued to pro uh, promote the, the, quote, big lie uh, that he had won the election. And of course, that term comes from uh, Hitler's Mein Kampf. Uh, but the problem is that a lot of people believed him, uh, they, particularly members of Congress. Uh, many Republicans in Congress went along with that, agreed that uh, or wouldn't, you know, said that uh, Trump had actually won the election when he hadn't or refused to uh, admit it. Uh, and so Republicans, uh, Republican leadership did that. And then Republicans throughout the United States uh, agreed with them uh, because they get, well, many people get their news only from uh, Fox News and very narrow perspective. And if their leaders, Republican leaders are saying that this is true, uh, that Trump actually won, they actually believed it. Uh, in addition, uh, state legislatures that were uh, controlled by Republicans and Republican governors uh, went through a uh, 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 a lot of uh, past laws, proposed laws to, to suppress votes in the in the United States, because Republicans think the fewer people votes, the more likely uh, the Republicans are going to win. Doing this by um, restricting access to voting, uh, purging voter registration rolls, uh, restricting access to mail and voting, reducing access to polling stations, limiting times for registrations and so forth, just to make it more difficult for people to vote because they think the more people vote, the more likely uh, Democrats are going to be uh, uh, elected. Also importantly, uh, they've worked on, uh, on placing people, Republicans, uh, into uh, administrative roles in the states. The, the people that are uh, counting the votes uh, and administering elections. Uh, and what they wanted to do is to get true Trump believers in there uh, who would uh, tilt things in favor of, uh, of President Trump uh, when he w w would run again. Uh, in addition, and uh, very discouragingly, uh, the, in addition to the January 6th uh, violence, a violent attack on the United States Capitol. Uh, the, uh, there are hundreds of election administrators in, in many states who were threatened with death uh, and, and other sorts of, of violence. 
And the FBI and the Homeland Security uh, decided that, or I mean, publicly said the major, major threats to of ter- terrorism in the United States are domestic uh, threats from uh, ex- <clears throat> from extremisms extremists in the, in the United States uh, supporting Trump. Now, of course, there's some violence on the left, but there's nowhere near comparison uh, between right-wing violence and left-wing violence in the United States. Right-wing is much more uh, uh, powerful. Um, okay, a respite. The elections, of, the congressional elections of 2022 uh, bought a respite for the United States because many, uh, though not all, of the people that Trump backed uh, did not get elected, particularly to secretary of state positions in the states who would have control over uh, counting, uh, counting votes. So that was, uh, 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 you know, it, people could breathe a sigh of, of relief uh, after that. Uh, and, it, and it was particularly important because uh, in congressional elections and off-year elections where the president is not up for uh, a re-election, uh, the, uh, the uh, party outside, uh, not held by the president, usually wins by a lot in both the House and the Senate. And this time, uh, the, the Democrats were able to con- keep control of the Senate, although they lost uh, the House uh, by just uh, a, a few votes. So it was a very unusual election and often and perceived by many of us as a rejection of Trump's uh, approach uh, and an attempt to politicize uh, or to uh, uh, influence American uh, elections in an illegitimate uh, way. But despite this, of course, as you know, Trump said that he's uh, going to run for president again uh, in 2024. And the problem is, if there are so many other, there are going to be a bunch of other uh, candidates for uh, who want the Republican nomination. And again, as happened in 2016, Trump may be able to split the opposition uh, and have, uh, you know, get more votes than, uh, you know, five or 10 other uh, Republicans. And so it's entirely plausible that he can become uh, the Republican nominee for president uh, again. <clears throat> so just, uh, you know, a, a broader perspective, uh, this uh, problem uh, is much broader than in the United States. Uh, sources of unrest uh, and temptation to populist uh, national authoritarian leaders, I think, derive primarily from economic inequality, elites becoming richer uh, due to uh, globalization and so forth, the cultural backlash of elites uh, scorning, being seen to scorn traditional values, uh, changing sexual mores and so forth, uh, and resentment from people that feel that they're downtrodden. Uh, and the consequences are the appeal of populist authoritarian leaders promising better economic circumstances. Of course, they can't uh, deliver that, but the danger is that people will be willing uh, to give them uh, a power in an authoritarian way. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fifner. I, um, no, I'm sure we'll all be um, watching with um, great interest in as events unfold leading up to the next presidential election. Uh, if you um, time for our Q and A now, uh, those joining online, if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the question box, and I'll read them out. Um, and if anybody in our audience has any questions, please feel t- um, free to raise your hand, and one of our staff in the national office will hand you a microphone. Andrew. Andrew Podger, I have a question based for Professor Her and Professor Lee. Professor Her, should Australia have engaged with BRI? assisting our neighbouring countries to ensure that the projects meet quality standards and are affordable? Is that a role that we should have played uh, in in the BRI? And Professor Lee, uh, could you clarify the distinction between your model of democracy plus Confucianism with uh, Confucianism having some impact on a more meritocratic uh, leadership and the traditional Westminster style democracy which separates politics and administration with the common phrase that experts should be on tap, not on top. Is that a distinction between this, the, the, the parliamentary Westminster type democratic tradition and what you're seeing emerging, say, in Singapore? I'm not, I'm not sure I fully understand your question, but I think um, I understand a little part of it. I think Confucian culture tended to promote meritocracy, even within uh, democratic political you know, institution. 
in Singapore, you can tell that uh, most uh, parliament members are highly educated. And uh, in the last general election, uh, there was one nominee by the ruling party uh, is a new blood they draw, you know, recommended by the ruling party. Uh, but uh, in social media, many uh, neighbors, former co-workers, and other people associated with him before complained, complained that uh, he was arrogant, he was selfish, and he was basically not virtuous. And uh, under pressure, uh, he resigned, uh, he pulled out even before the election day. I think that's the uh, virtue component of the Confucian culture. If you are in public office, you're supposed to be, you know, uh, have good virtues. And indeed, there is a survey uh, in Singapore on what they think is the most important quality uh, in a candidate. Uh, a good portion of people check virtue-related components. I think that is also a reflection of that culture behind it. We don't know what it would be like in China, uh, you know, if it turns, after it turns into a democracy. But in Taiwan, uh, you can see many uh, candidates are also highly educated, and uh, when they have personal uh, flaws, they were challenged. I think that's a reflection from my perspective. Uh, did I, I uh, answer your question? Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, um, Professor Lee. Bao Gang, did you want to uh, respond to Andrew's oh, okay. question? Yes, thank you. So, Andrew, thank you for your questions. So, the currently the question is out. Uh, Austria has been refused to join the BAR. But uh, uh, theoretically, uh, it, uh, <clears throat> imagine it differently. We can imagine Australia uh, join the BAI and influence the process. That's uh, the uh, influence the Chinese BAI from within. That is also a good option. But currently, there's a good option available for Australia, in particular in these uh, Pacific Island countries. So China have a huge investment. And Japan, Korea, our company also have investment. I think that one of the options for uh, Australia is to work with the Korea and the Japanese and work together, develop a high quality infrastructure uh, project. So, so let's have a kind of benign, um, as a French Howard called, benign strategic competition that will benefit people on the ground. Thank you, Bao Gang. Uh, are there any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Anna Kosovac, and I'm here. Um, I'm a lecturer here at the Faculty of Arts at the University of Melbourne. My question is for James. Um, I wanted to actually ask you about uh, <coughs> something that. Um, John Dryzak was talking about yesterday in terms of these care packages um, for the US, um, things that we can learn from Australia's electoral system. Um, do you think that implementing this type of care package, which just to reiterate, was looking at things like uh, compulsory voting, preferential voting, no primaries, independent electoral commission, maybe even a democratic sausage, because we do that a lot in Australia as well, um, and whether this would curb that breakdown of constitutional norms? Um, and if not, then what would it take, in your opinion? I think you're... Uh uh, asking me, would some of the uh, institutions that you have in Australia uh, help the United States? And my answer is yes, it would, 
but it also would be impossible in the United States. Now, compulsory voting, I think, uh, is a great idea. It, it's very democratic. Uh, but in the United States, there's such a, a individually a individualism, anti-government, you know, back from the revolution uh, centuries ago, uh, that still is very strong. And so there's just no way that the United States could do anything like that. Um, independent uh, commissions are good sometimes, but it's also very difficult. Like the, the Congress tried to put together an independent commission to examine the, the attacks on the Capitol of January 6th, uh, but the Republicans would not let that happen. Uh, and even when the, the Democrats put together a committee and invited <laughs> members of, of the Republican uh, members of Congress to, to participate, uh, their leadership, uh, uh, Kevin McCarthy said no, except for you know two very uh, courageous people, uh, Liz Cheney uh, and Adam Kinzinger, uh, did agree to to do it. And so uh, those sorts of independent, good government types of things are would be helpful, but very difficult to get through in the political context of, of the United States. Now, I, I'm not sure I hit all your points, but that was that was my uh, way of thinking about that uh, uh, issue. Thank you. Don, do you have a question? Yeah, a question to uh, Professor Fitner. Um, I'm Don Byrne. Um, I speak with the naivety of a psychologist. But I can't believe that every member of the Republican Party in the US is either uh, morally deficient or, or irrational or just plain stupid. And yet they <laughs> seem to continue to support uh, Trump in, in large numbers. Uh, and so, uh, I, I guess to to distill the question down to its its basics, what has he got on them that that uh, allows him to um, call on that extraordinary level of of support? What what power does he have? I think he has the power of of the demagogue. Uh, there's a lot of people that are disaffected for all those economic and cultural reasons uh, that I mentioned. There's a lot of resentment uh, against elites in general, but also resentment against uh, liberal in, in the U.S. context, uh, uh, Democrats, uh, seeing them uh, as uh, being blamed for all of the negative things uh, that, that are happening uh, in, the, in the United States. And they see Trump as sticking up for them. And even many of them who say, well, he's not so great and he's a, kind of a crude person and so forth, but at least he is on our side against um, uh, racial minorities who uh, many of Trump's followers think are getting benefits from the government that, that they themselves are, are not getting, uh, that they get to jump ahead of the line because of affirmative action uh, and so forth, that immigrants are coming into the country and trying to take away uh, their jobs, uh, that the secular of the liberal elite in the United States uh, is rejecting uh, traditional family values, traditional religious values. Uh, so it's really a cultural sort of thing. It's not strictly economic, but there's all that resentment out there. And Trump is able to, he's brilliant as a demagogue in being able to uh, elicit the, um, uh, their resentment and to channel it into supporting him uh, it, despite all of the, you know, the, the contradictions and, and so forth is just astounding, but I've watched it happen. And that's my you know best explanation as to why people continue to stick with Trump uh, despite all of those problems. Thanks. I'll um, just, oh, we've got another, um, yeah, Barry. Gore, um, a question a little out of left field, I suppose. New Zealand has no upper house. Australia and the US have elected upper houses. The British Parliament has an elected lower house and an appointed upper house. What kind of Confucian model describes that? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I think the British system uh, has a history and how it has started. And uh, now the Chinese China specifically uh, does not have that continuity anymore. Now the politicians are an entirely different batch. Uh, you know, they, those are pe are people in power now, an uh, entirely different batch. So how do you produce the so-called elite upper house uh, is a big challenge, is a big challenge. 
um, I, I think um, uh, you can have a, a qualification requirement uh, for people to take a public office. Uh, if you run for a governor, you need to have a certain level of education, for example. And that is, I think, something Confucian can support. But how to select these, peop uh, these people, I think there is no better way than uh, general election. That's my personal view. Thank you. John? So this, I mean, this is, a, in, I think, it's a question in um, similar spirit to, to Chen Yang Li, that um, your advocacy of uh, uh, democratic form with Confucian content, well, observation based on Singapore, um, as opposed to a Confucian democratic model. Um, one, one thing that occurred to me is I, I just wondered, uh, um, in this light, will any democratic form do? Um, or do you have any preference, um, for example, between um, adversarial versus uh, consensual democracies, um, presidential versus uh, uh, primary, sorry, presidential versus uh, parliamentary systems, um, uh, different, well, um, perhaps federal versus unitary? Um, will, in, in other words, will any form do? Or have you sort of um, it, it, it seems that um, in, um, in treating Confucian content as separate from democratic form, um, are you completely agnostic on precise democratic form, as long as it has elections? Okay. Thank you for your, for your question. Now, um, I'm not a, polit a political uh, theorist. Uh, I do not have enough knowledge to compare a different political uh, you know, democratic forms. So I uh, don't have uh, you know, preference for which specific one, the US model or the uh, British model. Uh, what I'm uh, emphasizing is that uh, they need, this public office holders need to be elected through general election. And uh, the voters decide who take what office. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the specific political uh, uh, you know, institution, I'm willing to consider a variety of possibilities. For example, uh, in Vietnam, I think it's the parliament, the uh, representatives elect their president. Uh, I think that would work as well as a comparison with the U.S. model, where people directly elect the president. I think either way, it is through general election. You know, people entrust these deputies, they cast their vote to elect the uh, president. I'm open to that. So uh, I don't have a specific answer to that. I, um, I insist it has to go through voters. Uh, in comparing China with Singapore, I think, whether citizens have a vote makes a tremendous difference. That's my point. But thank you for your question. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jane Watson. This is a, a very naive question to um, James. Um, I'm letting you know that I grew up in Kansas in the was educated in the 1950s and early 60s. And I felt I had a really good understanding. I had a courses in the Constitution. I thought I understood what democracy was all about. Now, I have been living happily in Australia, in Tasmania for 50 years. Uh, and I don't know, is it possible to blame what's happened to the education system since I was in school for a lot of these issues to do with Trump. Is it, did it fail so that people are so susceptible to these ideas? Because I don't think the people that I went to school with, even in Kansas, and I know that Kansas was a Republican state, um, I'm just really surprised. Can you tell me why? Well, I, w I went to school uh, uh, also uh, in a time where uh, the American institutions were accepted uh, much more. People believed in the Constitution, they studied civics uh, and so forth. <clears throat> but I don't think it's just the education system. I think part of it is the media 
uh, narrow casting. Uh, people can listen to whatever they want to. And, you know, on the right, the rise of right wing radio in the 1990s, they had a big impact. Uh, and so they only, so they may have taken civics, but if they only hear about politics, uh, from the people that agree with them and from uh, Trump supporters and so forth, uh, they're willing to go along with that. And they don't have a, an appreciation of democracy or how important that is, or even, uh, the Bill of Rights. Uh, so it's, uh, it, it's frustrating, uh, but I'm not sure you can educate that out of people. I think people are not, in general, they're not uh, informed about politics or the Constitution. And so, you know, a certain elite people go to school and they learn, uh, you know, the, the, the fundamentals, uh, but there's a lot of people uh, that, that don't, uh, and they're subject to demagogic, demagogic appeals uh, and uh, you know, the frustrations, the economic frustrations, cultural frustrations come out. Uh, and so I think that, you know, education is crucial, but education wouldn't, is not the cause of it, and it can't fix it, but it is nevertheless essential. Thank, thank you, Dr. Fifner. Um, we're really coming up, it's just past 10.45, which is the end of our session today. Uh, I've Please join with me in thanking our panelists this morning, Professor James Fifner, Professor Cheng Yang Li, and Professor Bao Gang He. Um, we're going to break for morning tea now, and um, we'll join you back here at 11:15. Uh,